spring Sabbath like this, how can you say anything else? You know, I was driving, um, I think it was Tuesday, I was driving across Maple Street Bridge, and I looked out across the valley, and all of a sudden it hit me. It was, it was different. The leaves were out. The leaves were out, and I got so excited, just that fresh, those little tiny leaves you know, one at a time, change the whole, the whole color, the whole the valley and, and all. And I just said, thank you again, Lord, for new life. Just amazing. These are my helpers. These are my grandchildren, Sydney and Jared. I'm really glad you're here to help me, and we'll use this just a little later. But they're getting all ready. Okay. I would like to pray just one more time. Father, we look to your word to understand better how to be your disciples. Please be present in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this disciple thing, let's just, um, let's just take a minute and review why is it important Would you go to the Gospel Commission with me? Matthew 28, get your Bibles out, please. What is a disciple? You know, if if we forget the basics, if we forget the basics, things really get garbled up sometimes. So what is it that God expects from his church? Well, notice what Jesus himself said. And by the way, these were some of the very last words he had to say to disciples. And I don't know... Whether the rule applies or not, but I think it does. When, when I was a little boy, mother kept the important thing right down to the end. When we were going to school in the morning, she was, she was there by the door, and she always had a list of things. Now, do you have your snow boots on? Do you have, get your parka tied up around your head? Do you have your lunch? Are you, are you ready to go? Um, and she'd go through this, this list of things. I always knew that there was important instruction to listen to because when I failed to listen to it invariably the day didn't go all that well and I think Jesus had something important here to say for, to, to us and so if you have your Bibles I would invite you to read I have the New King James and I would invite you to read it with me I'm starting with the red letter all authority okay I'm going to start there just read it together with me all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Last words, right down at the end of his ministry. And Jesus is saying, go, therefore, and make disciples. It has to be basic. It has to be important. It has to be critical. And so what about this business of being a disciple? Well, shortly before this, you will recall, in fact, it was right after the communion that they had had to gather, the very first communion, and I... As I look at Passover time and all, it's the springtime, and uh, I can imagine that things were just beginning to blossom out. When they had finished the communion, and they went out that eastern gate and headed down into the little Kidron Valley, and then up kind of on the shoulder of the Mount of Olives, where Gethsemane was. Remember now, 
What time was the communion I'm, uh, as far as uh, daylight? Was there any daylight when they finished? Probably not. It probably was dark, maybe amid dusk a little bit. But as they headed out, there must have been a big harvest moon or springtime moon, I should say. And Jesus, as they walked through one of these vineyards, used this opportunity to talk about discipleship in a way that I think is very unique. That's what I want to look at with you just a bit today. You should have received this. Do you have this? Good for you. Okay, anybody not get one? I wanna s I'm going to check on my deacons. I got a few hands, deacons. Brother deacons, there's two or three here, and there are quite a few up in the balcony that didn't get, that didn't get one. There's one, and then there's two up here, and then the balcony needs probably a dozen or more. Okay? Thank you. Appreciate it. So Jesus used this vineyard, and he used the vine to teach some basic lessons about what a disciple is. And so I've kind of summarized it here with these five dimensions of a disciple's profile, John 15. Uh, 1 to 17 is what we're going to look at. And uh, I've put some lines there. You can use that, or it, you don't have to if you don't want to. But I'm just asking you to kind of apply it personally as we go through these. I um, want to uh, start out with John chapter 15, and we're just going to look at those first Ten verses, And again, I'm encouraging you to use your Bible. If you don't have one, there should be a New King James Bible in the pew right ahead of you. Aren't we privileged? There are people that don't have Bibles. I mean, this is amazing. All we have to do, reach out and take one out of the holder in front of us. So here we go. Verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. If I might apply that to us just a little bit more specifically, the true vine, Jesus was talking about the fact that back in the Old Testament, Israel was looked at as divine. In fact, if you want to make a notation there, you can write it on that yellow sheet. In Isaiah chapter 5, in those first few verses, it talks about Israel as a vine. I'm not going to take time to go there today. The problem was Israel didn't produce the fruit that God had intended to, to produce. In fact, the story back there says they produced wild grapes. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around wild grapes. The ones I've tasted are yuck. Oh, they are so bitter, they are terrible. And so it's like I don't want to have anything to do with those. God sa uh, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Okay? In a sense, he's starting over, okay? And my father is the vine dresser. Today we might say he's the master gardener. And every branch, verse 2, in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Are you getting the point? God has something that he wants to happen to those who are connected with him. The first thing... Um, yeah, let me go on. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Remember, this is just following the communion. Lots of reference back to that. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it, what? Abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. You got the idea. Come on, help me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words Abide in you, you will also ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Verse 9, as the Father loved me, 
I also have loved you. Come on. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Do you think it's clear as to what he's trying to say to us? If we are going to be one of his disciples, one of his branches, we need to what? We need to abide in him. Now that word can be different in some other translations, I realize. It's a, it's a very simple Greek word, and it means either to, to dwell in, to make a home in, to connect with, to remain in. Today, I think we might say, Jesus is saying, I really want you to connect with me. I want to be able to feel along with you. I, I want you to be able to resonate with, with my concerns. I really believe he, that, was, that was his underlying concern. And you know, it's amazing to me that Jesus, our creator, wants us to be so intimately connected with him. Doesn't that, I mean, he's not, he's not just making us and say, okay, grow up and go off and do your own thing. He doesn't say that. I want you to be with me. I want you to abide with me. I want you to connect with me. That is very important to our Savior. That's a disciple. You and I need to learn how to connect with him. Now, what's the option here? Did you notice an option? If we don't abide? Huh? Huh? We're pruned, somebody said. Yeah, we're pruned, yes. We are. We are separated from him. He said it very clearly there in verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, there's the option, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Okay, Sydney and Jared, I need your help. This is a very real thing to Jesus. In the natural world, he understands this very well because he's the creator that put this all together. And so, one by the one table, one by the other, there we go. Just, just hold them for a moment so I can, so I can get close and snitch one. If, if, if I have the chance. No, you hang on to it. No, yeah, you, this is yours. Hang on to it, kiddo. Hang on to it. Good job. Aren't those beautiful? Huh? Those are globe grapes. Ah, uh, those are globe grapes. They came all the way from Peru. They are absolutely wonderful. Jesus said he wanted us to develop much fruit. Now, I know this is, this is from the natural kingdom now, right now, but he's also talking spiritually, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Now, what's the other option? What do you have here, Jared? A stick. All right, what kind of a stick is it? Well, I don't even remember for sure which tree. Actually, it came from my place. Let's just set it down like that. But this stick, what happened to it down there? It got cut off from the tree, didn't it? And I don't know exactly how long ago, but I can tell you this. It's dead. It's a dead stick. And uh, what can you do with a dead stick like this? It's really not much good for anything but burning. It's just not very useful. There's no, there's no life in it. You know, Jesus said that in our sins, we are dead. We are dead to life. And so here we have it. Why don't you just, let, let's lean the, just lean the stick right up against this. It's only good for one thing, that is to make a fire, and that might be good that but and you can lay those I just set those right here that's the alternative and I thank you for your help okay uh, oh. I saw that Jared you know Ellen White has something that in steps of Christ has always been uh, such a blessing page 69 
is absolutely one of my favorite quotes of hers. Many have an idea that they must do some part of the work alone. That's what happens when we think we can do it alone. Okay? Right here. They have trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sin, but now they seek by their own efforts to live aright. But every such effort must fail. Jesus says, without me, you can't, come on, do, do nothing. Our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness, in other words, our service, all depend upon our union with Christ. It is by communion with him daily, no, she even goes beyond that. Hourly, by abiding in him, that we are to grow in grace. He is not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. It is Christ first and last and always. Say that with me. It is Christ first and last and always. In other words, that's the only way we are going to arrive at the purpose that God has for you and me in our lives. And you can be sure when we arrive at his purpose, it will be fulfilling. It will be a wonderful, wonderful experience. Now, we are looking there at 15, 1 to 10, in other words, that's number one. Somebody may say to me, you know, I hear this all the time. I need to study my Bible, and I need to pray, but it just doesn't seem like it ever gets beyond that, just hearing it. I want to make a recommendation to you, something that I have found to be probably the most useful and the most meaningful thing in terms of connecting with God on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometime, oh, I don't know how many years ago, not, I'm not even going to go there, but a, a good friend of mine, in fact, a pastor friend of mine, said, you know, I've tried this, and it worked. And he gave me, actually gave me this, this little journal. And it's nothing but a, but a, a journal that with line pages. And, and he said, do soap every day. Really? Soap? Okay, detergent soap, what the, no, no, S-O-A-P, okay, soap. He said, just take this, and he said, whatever, wherever you're reading in the Bible, if you're reading through the Bible, or if you're just picking it up one morning, and, and you're just reading a particular verse, or whatever you're doing, he said, before you read that verse, just say, God, what is it you're trying to tell me? What is it that I need to hear from this verse this morning? Simple prayer, okay? Then he said, read the verse. And he said, write it down. Really? That's S, scripture. Write it down, S. Well, but just write the scripture down. And he says, if it's too long, just write the most important part that you pick out of it. Just write it down. He said there's something about processing that in the brain and writing it out that will make you think in ways that you wouldn't if you do not. So, Scripture, S. Then, O. That's as you have read it, what has especially stood out to you? What has come to your attention? That's observation, your observation. You just write whatever the Lord impresses upon your thinking, observation. So I'll write a little paragraph on observation. Then A, application. How could I take that and apply it in my life? Application. And I'll write just maybe, maybe a sentence, maybe a couple sentences. And then finally, P, pray. Pray over what you have just tried to apply or that you've been thinking about. S-O-A-P, SOAP. Now, I want to say to you, because there's a broad difference in age here in this congregation, if you work 
digitally and, and you'd prefer to do it on the computer, go for it. I'm not saying you have to sit down and write it out, even though there is something about writing it out that is pretty interesting. Make it yours, apply it, and it will connect you in ways. I can tell you, if, in fact, I would, uh, I would challenge you. Try it for a month. Try it for a month. And at the end of the month, make sure you write it on your calendar. At the end of the month, sit down and evaluate it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Try it for a month. And I believe you will find what I found, that it, it brought me into a relationship where I was, I was thinking God's thoughts after him in ways that I had never done before. Really recommend soap, good old soap. Well, if you, you know, you can do that too. And I, and I certainly recommend memorizing Scripture as well. Before I go any further, I want to do a kind of a change up on you here. Um, do you believe Jesus is coming back soon? Yeah, so do I. And I want to ask you the question, do you think he's still the vine today? Okay, is he the vine is he the vine that extends throughout the world, throughout all the cultures and all the languages? Do you, do you believe that? Do you as you look at the world today and the condition things are in do you think there are certain parts of the world where maybe the vineyard is not doing so well? Where would some of those places be? I hear Middle East, yeah. Yeah, I hear Middle East, I hear China. You know, I was, I, I'm of, I, I agree with you, I w I'm of the same opinion that there are parts of the world where Wow, I just wonder how in the world, Lord, are you, how are you going to make disciples in those Arab countries or in Persia, the old Persia, or over there in Pakistan and India? I mean, it, it really raises big questions in my mind sometimes. And then I just want to tell you about a book that I came across and took the time to read, and it's called A Wind in the House of Islam. Because if you look at the 1040 window, and I think most of you kind of know what I'm talking about when I say 1040, do you? Okay. If you look at the 1040 window, the majority of that lies in these Muslim countries. Okay. And, and so I've wondered, Lord, is there some way that you are reaching these people for you? Do you have disciples there? Well, I looked at this book, and it so piqued my curiosity. Um, I began reading it and read a, a good chunk of it on our vacation in Costa Rica. I, can I couldn't put the thing down. It was just really stirring me. Because did you know, at the death of Muhammad, in about 630 or so, from then until the end of the 19th century, there were only two movements among the Muslim people where Christianity made a serious impact, where there were over a thousand baptisms or where there were over a hundred churches that were newly started. I mean, essentially, Christianity has not been able to impact Islam. It's just been like impossible. I mean, 12, 12 and a half centuries with zero up until 1965. And then there were two movements, one in Indonesia and another one uh, in um, Ethiopia. Twelve and a half centuries, folks. But it's interesting. In the 20th century then, there were 11 movements. I'm talking about one well, movement now. I'm ta not talking about one person. I'm talking about at least 1,000 conversions and at least 100 new churches. Then right beginning, like four, 15, 16 years ago now, 
something began to happen. They're, they have found 69 independent movements scattered. Can you make this thing work? There we go. Scattered all the way across the countries of Islam. From North Africa and West Africa on the west, all the way across the north of Africa, all across the middle uh, Middle, Amer uh, middle uh, e Ages, um, Persian world, Turkestan, which is kind of the underbelly of the old Soviet Union, Western South Asia and Eastern South Asia where you have India and you have Pakistan and you have Bangladesh and then clear down to uh, Indonesia or Indo-Malaysia. Th those are the m nine major Muslim countries. And this man, David Garrison, uh, he's actually a Baptist. He began to do some research and he wanted to see, has anything been going on? Because he knew about some of these movements. He grew up um, in, in Egypt and, and uh, studied uh, Arabic there. And, and he's, a, he's a student of what is happening in the Muslim world. In every one of those sections, in every one, he calls them rooms. There are nine major uh, cultural uh, rooms, every one of them, including the Middle East, there are uh, there is at least one movement of former Muslims toward Christianity. It is an amazing astonishment. We don't hear this on the news. I mean, you hear very, very little. We don't know what's going on. He actually traveled a quarter of a million miles and did over a thousand interviews in 29 of those countries, okay? In 29 of those countries. It's, a, it's, it's astonishing. His, his conclusion was that there are 69 new movements among the Muslims toward Christianity, conversions happening of 1,000 conversions or more or 100 new churches. Um, and then some of you know about Jim a year, I think. Jim works with the Adventist World Radio. You know about Adv Adventist World Radio, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, and he wrote the little book. Some, some call them miracles. Um, I wanted to just, I wanted to just uh, read this one section here because he does such a good job of summing up what is going on. There are stories coming from many parts of the world speaking to the fact that God wants to wake up the Muslim community to the reality of the creator God. Jesus is appearing to Muslims in dreams and visions as a man dressed in white. Angels are visiting them in person, giving Bible studies, and the Holy Spirit is urging them to study and discover Isa al-Masih, Jesus, the Messiah of the Quran. When studying their own book, many are discovering that Jesus is coming back to the earth and that there will be a judgment, a final judgment. In other words, Muslims by and large believe in the second coming of Christ. They believe it. They're Adventists. Don't know it. It's interesting. But many Muslims tell us the story. They cannot find peace or cleansing in preparation for the judgment, and they are only able to find it in the Old and New Testament. Or in other words, there's a call back to Scripture. And you know, as I studied this, I, I did not realize that many, many of these people uh, have not had access to Bibles in their heart language. You know what heart language is. What the language that they're, that they're raised with. And only in recent years, in many places, um, have they been developing these new Bibles so that they can read it in their own heart language. And you know, every time that happens, and that's what happened in, in Indonesia in 1965. They came up with a new uh, colloquial kind of language that these people could understand. And following that was a revival, and that was the first breakthrough for a large group or a movement of Muslims toward Christianity. It just gives me goosebumps. The other big thing with this is that for most of them, did you know that the Quran that many of these people have been using is in, in the old Arabic? 
And because it's in the old Arabic, they don't understand it. They don't understand it at all. It's, it's, it's like reading hieroglyphics to them. And I'm thinking, and they would spend all these years. These little boys, they're often started at, well, some of the stories I read, they were started at two years of age. Some four and five. And they are expected to study. And they're away from home, by the way. They're put in a special school. And they study the Quran nonstop. They will memorize it word for word in a language that they don't even understand. So another big breakthrough has been, especially with the Internet and some of these other kinds of things, they are now getting the Quran in their own language. And as they study their Quran in their own language, they are understanding that they, d they don't have salvation. There's, there is no s assurance of salvation in the Quran for them. That's what drives them to the Scripture. I'll tell you, things are breaking loose, folks, in ways that just says to me, our Savior, the vine, the true vine, is working in ways that we have no imagination of to prepare this world for his second coming. It thrills me to realize that they have the opportunity to be connected as you and I do. Look at number two on your yellow sheet. A disciple bears fruit. A disciple, when he connects, bears fruit. Our example here are these beautiful grapes. But look at verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So God isn't satisfied with just some little piece of fruit. He wants how much? More fruit. And verse 4, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So we are dependent upon him. Go on to verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. There are other verses in the Bible that tells us that when the word of God dwells in our heart that we will bear fruit. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. Notice, uh, God has a purpose for us and, is it, and it isn't just living life, um, doing our own selfish things. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. So it's not just much fruit, but that the fruit should continue on and remain. Um, Jim Ayer tells a, an amazing story that I must mention to you because I do believe that the true vine is preparing his vineyard. This came from Kenya. A Muslim had a dream more than 400 years ago in which he was told to move to another country and one day his offspring would be given new truth. He did move his family. And that clan is now more than one million people strong. In more recent times, a member of the family was given a dream in which he was told to take a journey to another city and that he would be told what to do. Guess how old that person was? Any 12-year-olds here today? Any 12-year-olds? That little boy was 12 years old, and he received this, this, this direction from the Lord. Go to this city. And it was quite a ways away. And I have someone I want you to meet there. Well, his mother must have believed in him because she gave him the money to go. And he went. He made the trip. And he kind of wandered around in this big, distant city and didn't know what to do. He was about ready to go home. In fact, he was headed to board the hometown train when an elderly couple walked up to him and called him by name. They were Seventh-day Adventist missionaries. And those two, those three, had an opportunity to share. They gave him the Adventist message. That young man, that 12-year-old boy, it's not wonderful that God would, I mean, you know, it's like Samuel, or, you know, that's, isn't that cool? 
He takes it back, takes it back to his people. Well, the story goes on because this young man soon become an, became an adult. He died. His children now are now carrying the three angels' message to this clan, a clan of almost one million people. They are very quiet Sabbath keepers in this country that I don't even know the name of because they don't dare mention it. Now just, do you see how God is doing this? This is all I'm trying to say to us. Let's not give up in discouragement. Let's not think that Al-Qaeda and their ilk are taking over everyone. That is not true. God is at work in his vineyard in ways that we don't even realize. A recently converted Muslim was visiting a remote village in another country when upon entering a home, he was met by a man who excitedly told him, you are the man of my dream. I saw you in my dream, and you are going to help me find the truth of God. So this man took time to sit down with this brother Muslim, and together they studied the Adventist message. There are people groups all over the world, some in isolated places that are receiving divine instruction in very miraculous way, ways. A friend of one of uh, our producers and his family made their way as missionaries into the dense jungle mountain area of the Philippines, only to discover that their arrival had been announced by dreams given to the village chief. So when they started the evangelistic meetings, the call went out from the chief, and everybody came and attended. You know what part of it is? Part of it is the devil has pushed his agenda so far to such an extreme. There is such ugliness and such terror that many of these Muslims just say there's got to be more to life than this. We cannot go on living like this. And they have denied that the terrorism and the death and the, you know, the beheadings and all of that stuff that is just so far out. You know what they say? We are looking for a new Sharia. Now you've heard the Sharia law. You've heard that, haven't you? Haven't you that, heard that word? It simply means we're looking for a new way of life. We are looking for a new way of life. Who do you suppose is awakening that hunger in them? Absolutely. And so I believe that God wants us to bear much fruit. Look at number three. A disciple is what? Obedient. obedient. Number three, obedient. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Notice, though, when he talks about the commandments here, that they are always couched in what? Love. Okay, let's not forget that. They really go together. Verse 10 and verse 14. I must tell you the story of Sheik Hakim. Sheik Hakim. He's a young man, really. Probably in his mid-30s or so. When I was born, my father took a vow. My son will only study the Quran and never work for me. So from the age of two until I was 18, I only studied the Quran. Can you imagine that? Hakim is a hafez, meaning he has memorized the Quran. So he felt a real need to accept the gospel because of some of the wicked stuff he saw uh, happening. Um, he does talk about when he was a Muslim. He burned uh, Christian churches. Uh, he would kill. If anybody said that Jesus was God, that was enough to set him off. He would kill. But he said, I accepted the gospel because it came to me in my own way of understanding. At the time, I was the overseer of four mosques and was training 300 Islamic teachers. One day, a local African evangelist ga gave me an inheal. An inheal is a New Testament in Arabic. Before this happened, I thought that all injils were corrupt and lost. But this was in Arabic. I believed Arabic to be the language of God. So it could not be corrupted. So he started to study the New Testament. First, this evangelist shared with me a teaching that both Muslims and Christians share, that Jesus is 
and coming again. Come on. Thank you, Lord. And those who do not believe in him, he will destroy with his breath. This was the same teaching as the Quran teaching. So I was confused. I pray to Allah, you know my heart. If there's something I, I must do, show me. Guess what God did? He gave him a dream. And in the dream, he saw someone out working on the mosque's uh, minaret. And he was up there at the speaker, up to talk, trying to fix this thing. And then he said, I looked again into the base of the minaret. I saw there was another man down there with an axe. And he was chopping the minaret down. Then as I looked closer, I saw that that man was me. Four times I had the dream. The next morning I went and found the evangelist who had given me the angel and asked him, what does this mean? He smiled and explained, you are going to man win many sheiks to the Lord. So immediately I became a follower <laughs> of Jesus. And immediately I met with great persecution. Though Hakim did not say it, some of the other sheiks told me that as a result of his conversion to Christ, Sheikh Hakim lost his job, his farm, nearly his life. His own father hurled a spear at his, at his apostate son, piercing his back and nearly killing him. Today, Hakim moves from town to town because there are always those who are trying to kill him. What do we say? A disciple is obedient. Does he sound obedient to you? Um, over the next seven months, we saw 74 sheiks come from our people group come to faith in Jesus. Right now, there are more than 400 sheiks who have come to the Lord. Incredulous, I asked, how many of these sheiks have been baptized? Hakim responded immediately, immediately, more than 300 so far. Later, I was shown a photograph, and I'm surprised they would take this. I was shown a photograph of 75 sheiks dressed in white, standing in line before one of the region's beautiful lakes, awaiting baptism. Jesus, the true vine, is working on his vineyard. Look at four. A disciple is what? Joyful. Look, look at verse 11. That's, I love that verse. 15, it is 11, right? Yeah, 11. These things I have spoken to you, that what? My joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full, filled up. Not just a little bit, filled up. I love the verse in Hebrews 12 too where it talks about Jesus. Went to the cross with joy. I tell you, it's a different kind of joy than what I've often taught was joy. How about you? He had a purpose, he had a mission, and he knew he was fulfilling it. My goodness, I've got to quit. But I've got, I've got to, you, you've got to hear this one. This happened in Turkestan. One of the Turkestani brothers saw my look of concern and flashed a sympathetic smile. Don't worry, he said. We are rejoicing in Christ. We have a saying. When you were persecuted, thank God that you have not been thrown into prison. If you have been thrown into prison, thank God that you've not been beaten. If you have been beaten, thank God that you have not been killed. He paused and smiled. And if you have been killed, thank God that you and him will be in heaven too. Joy? Joy. A disciple loves as Christ loved. Um, one of these, one of these men, one of these converts said this. He's a 32-year-old Muslim, <coughs> today a pastor, was asked what God is using to draw Muslims to faith into his community, and he said, love is the major thing. Muslims don't really practice love and charity, he said. First, you must love them, 
Then you pray for them, and when they learn that God answers their prayers, they renounce Islam and follow Christ. I talked to a 22-year-old woman from a strong Muslim background. She had been a Christian for eight months. She said, Christianity is so sweet. I love the way Christians treat each other. Ooh. Huh. What do you think? You know what? I love, I love that about this church too. And Megan, where are you, Megan? Megan? Megan gave a testimony last week here that touched my heart. She said, I have felt accepted and loved here. And I thought, that's the way it needs to be, right? If we're connected to the vine. She says, Jesus answers my prayers. I asked a young woman from a strong Islamic family who disowned her when she became a believer. I said, following Jesus took a lot from your life, didn't it? She replied adamantly, no. Now I can preach. I can sing. I can talk to people about Jesus. That is exciting to me. I am a changed person now. I am no longer a part of the world. Conclusion. How are you growing as a disciple? How am I growing? I believe with all my heart God is preparing his vineyard. Are you and I attached? Are we really attached to him? Are we abiding in him? Praise God. Praise God. Wrap it up. Amal is a 21-year-old college graduate who's been a follower of Christ for nearly two years. She's anticipating being married. She said, as I was getting older, I was convinced that Islam was right. It was just formality. It wasn't right. It was just formalities, rituals, words. I read the Quran, but I couldn't under understand it. I thought, there's so much terrorism and killing of innocents. In the Christian faith, I saw that there was love and peace. But in Islam, there was just fear of doing the wrong thing. You see, when you and I live that number five, the love, you see what it does to those around us. I could see that there was truth in Christianity because there was love. There's no power like that, is there? I was able to see the difference between the truth and the, the lie. I began to open the, the internet and search by the way, the internet and the, the movie um, Jesus, the story of Jesus and the book, Gospel of Luke, those have been very, very important tools. I began to open the internet and search. I looked at um, some of the teachings from some of these Christians who now are bold enough to even get on, on the internet. Then I started having visions of light. I would always see light. I would sit by myself and pray, God, I want to know the truth. Please give me the truth to come to you. Then God opened up to me and showed me the way of Jesus and the way of peace and truth and love. Today I have seven groups that I lead. There are about 35 total in these groups. I asked them all, who is Jesus to you? She said, he is the father to us. He's my friend. He's my love. He is my Lord God. And who is Muhammad, I asked. I don't see him as a prophet. He didn't come to give a message from God. He gave us his thoughts, his own independent ideas. I asked her about her plans for marriage. I'm not going to marry anyone other than a believer. No one will tell me what I must think. This will be difficult because my father is a strong, strong Muslim and will want to know that my husband is a devout Muslim. Less than a year later, Amal's father gave her as a wife to a man from a strong Muslim family. Before her first year of marriage, was over, Amal's new family discovered her faith in Christ. They responded by beating her to learn the names of those through whom she had come to faith in Christ. Then they sequestered her from leaving the house. She has never been seen since. Being attached doesn't mean that there will not be difficulties. But you and I can be part of this, this vine that really covers the earth. 
Did you know that even as we sit here today, and I found this, you get the Adventist world, this is April 2016, willing to die for their faith. There are 17 couples, Seventh-day Adventist couples, from South America who are today in the Middle East. And they're in the Middle East to become tent maker missionaries. They are only supported until they can get their own profession, whatever it may be, going. And then they're really on their own. And this article simply points to the fact that they have to be prepared to even lose their life, possibly, if they get in the wrong kind of a set of circumstances. I guess my, my prayer to, that I would encourage all of us to think about, we need to be praying that God will hasten this work and that the Muslim people, do you know how many Muslims there are in the world? 1.6 billion. 1.6 billion. They need to have an opportunity to know Jesus. They need to be connected to the vine. And you can see some are learning. Some are getting the idea. And God's spirit is working. And I believe it's one of the greatest signs that Jesus' return is nearer than we think. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for being the vine dresser, for being the vine, for your Father's assistance, for your commitment to your disciples to carry out their influence in this world that is so racked with evil and wickedness. Thank you that there's reason to be hopeful that your spirit is working in an unusual way. And I want to pray for these different groups around the world, from West Africa all the way to Indonesia and up into, Tur up into Turkestan and, and, and around the Middle East. Dear Father, pour out your spirit upon these people. And Lord, help us to be faithful disciples here and do what we can because we are connected to you May our lives be full of the fruit that you want us to have. For this I pray, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, I'm Dave Lounsbury, and I'm the pastor here at the Spokane Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I want to thank you for joining us with our worship today. Whether you're watching on Channel 14 or on our YouTube channel or some other way, we're thankful that you've joined us. If you happen to live in the Spokane area, we'd de be delighted to have you come and worship with us. We're located at 828 West Spofford on the north side of Spokane, and we'd be delighted to get to know you. If you're interested in Bible study, we love to do Bible studies as well. You can contact us through our website or through email or through phone or through a variety of ways, and all that information is at the end of the video. But come and visit us sometime and visit us often here on YouTube or Channel 14 as well. God bless you.